Okay, so while we are setting up, uh, let me introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Ben Zhao, who is a new Bobber professor of computer science at the University of Chicago. And he's going to talk about how to mitigate harms of general generative AI using adversarial tools. So kind of an interesting notion that now we invented this new technology, but how to invent measures how to make this technology to not to harm us. So yeah, please. Thank you. All right, so so I apologize for a little bit because I think uh, there's going to be a little bit of a whiplash from the topical switch. Um, you went from the depth of, of core learning theory and, and some very interesting mathematics to probably as opposite as you're going to get in, in this workshop, at least. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about the security and, and sort of the attacks and defenses involving generative AI. Uh, in, in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, some actual tools that we've deployed and, and maybe a little bit of experience if we can get to it. All right, so mitigating harms of generative AI using our shared tools. Um, you know, so I think by now I, I just removed all my slides that talk about diffusion models and what they look like and, and how they work and so on. I assume everybody who's here or watching probably already has a decent understanding of how they work. Certainly more than I can correctly describe in two slides or whatever it is. Um, so I'll just throw up some images here of, of, you know, and these are completely out of date also, right? This is not the latest generation. I think this is like mid journey four probably. Uh, but clearly we've all seen these images, the images of this type that, that basically demonstrate how far generative AI has come. Lots of images that look completely realistic, photorealistic, et cetera, they look like real people. And unless you have a particularly artistic eye and are able to pick out specific patterns and inaccuracies or nonsensical features in the images is very, very difficult oftentimes to detect uh, what is real from what is not. Right, some more images, for example, things uh, just demonstrating the versatility of some of these image generators. Uh, they are incredibly versatile in terms of style and content and composition and so on. Um, yeah, although here, I think if you stare really closely, you can see some of the imperfections that give away why they're generative AI, not human drawn, right? So for example, the Mandalorian-like armor, uh, the little divots on there make absolutely no sense. Um, you know, there's little funny thing going on with the reflection in the water on the left, and then there are pagodas that are doing some sort of uh, little merging going on, <laughs> if you look very closely. Okay, so, but these are compositional effects. They, they rarely are sort of pixel level uh, issues that, that, uh, that stand out. Those issues have mostly been fixed as well as things like hands and whatnot. So this is sort of where we are now. And of course, these are already out of date. So the images are that you can get now from the latest and greatest, uh, whether it's XCXL or Mid Journey 5 or Dolly 3, are even better. So what's the problem? Well, I mean, fundamentally, I think you've all probably heard this well enough from other places as well. All these models come from sort of uh, fruits of the poison tree uh, to put it one way, right? Um, all these models have been trained on human images, uh, most of which uh, were obtained without consent, against copyright, without compensation or credit. So there's lots of legal issues going on there. I'm not here to talk about any of these things. This is obviously not that kind of workshop. Um, but I'll just, you know, just mention this, obviously, because this is, lies at the fundamental uh, underpinning for much of these models. And I want to talk a little bit about actual harms that, that are realistic today. Uh, first, just in sort of general anecdotes. Um, I don't know, any show of hands, how many people have seen this particular image? Anyone? I found this on, I don't know, I, I think it was on Twitter. Um, and my first reaction was, wow, that is really impressive because that's what the previous person who shared it said. And I was like, wow, that's that's some intricate level, next level, you know, sandcastle work. Um, and then it took me a few seconds to figure out that is like physically really, really difficult or maybe impossible to build sand and make it look like hair. And then, you know, a few seconds later, I noticed the woman's hair on the other side looks like real human hair. And then my next reaction was, well, maybe this is like some actress they paid to sit there while someone else painted sand over their face. To, to you know defraud someone and 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 make a really good looking image and then it took me another few minutes to notice the background errors there's a there's a woman whose feet sort of deteriorate into some sort of 
I don't know what you call it. I, I'm at a loss for some sort of growth thing that comes down. And then there's another woman at the right where you can't tell whether it's an arm or a leg or something that points up. Uh, and, and so short version is that this is completely synthetic. Right. And, and it's a good enough synthetic that unless you really start paying attention, it's very easy to spread this around social media and be like, hey, this is fantastic. So this is something that, that I, I got passed by one of my friends who was like, oh, look at this. And then this one I found completely by myself on Facebook, no less. Uh, this was one of the ads that was served to me on the Facebook feed. And I was like, wow, those look really kind of cool. Um, again, it took me a few minutes before I noticed that it's funny. Why are all the images like? you know, have this funny background that's like neither here or there and, and sort of a movie studio quality. Um, and then I, I started and I noticed that there's no pattern to any of these sort of designs. And then I get really suspicious and I start poking around at the network registry for who uh, owns this particular domain and, and so on and so forth. And I poke around enough to realize that this is a scam um, and this is a fake website. And if you go and buy some of these lamps, you won't get them because these lamps don't exist. Um, they're also generated with synthetic AI. Uh, more sort of uh, public attention uh, fiascos in recent uh, memory. Uh, the image on the left is is for a book cover. Uh, the book is called Bob the Wizard. And it's notable because this particular cover won a prize, uh, an annual book, book cover art prize. Um, and it raised quite a bit of uh, sort of attention when after it won the prize, some artists pointed out that that doesn't look like real art. That looks like a synthetic. And in fact, you can tell, um, you know, they point out some uh, inconsistent features with it and so on. And then what followed after was an interesting sort of back and forth between uh, multiple stakeholders in this, in this little quarrel. Uh, the, the author arguing that, no, 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 I know this, I, I, I know this artist, I pay them good money. They, they produce this piece of art for me. I can vouch for them. The artist saying, no, no, I'm human. That's just perfectly human produced. I did this thing from scratch. Here are all these you know, digital uh, proofs that I have from Photoshop, different PSD layer files and whatnot. And the argument went back and forth until someone, uh, an artist no less, uh, noticed that one of the Photoshop layers had the remnants of a mid-journey prompt uh, still remaining in the metadata. So that ended the conversation. Um, and then about... I would probably say the, the next day, uh, the artist that was involved in this particular piece of work disappeared offline and was never heard from again. Um, similar kind of thing. This one was a art piece that was sold to a well-known uh, award-winning actress who, who actually uh, was one of the original voiceover artists for the uh, Scooby-Doo show, back the cartoon, back in many, many decades ago. And so she had a particular attachment to this piece of art, paid a fair bit of money for it. Uh, and then only later on, when she posted about it, uh, was told by her artist friend that this was, in fact, uh, completely AI generated. And the way that you can tell is you can look at, for example, the pupils. Uh, there are square pupils inside the uh, square irises inside the pupils. There are funny button positioning things. And then there's, if I remember correctly, there's a sleeve that goes awry somewhere. Anyway, so this is just, yeah. Oh, because the competition is is namely uh, disallows AI art. Okay. Well, also because the author was convinced that they were buying real art, right? So, so the cost is really quite different. Uh, a human commissioned art oftentimes takes a month of effort to produce, whereas obviously we all have a general idea of how fast it is to generate something from a journey even if you iterate prompts right, for, for hours, for example. OK, so, so let's get a little bit more granular. So, so this is uh, Kelly McKernan, and, and, and I've gotten to know her a little bit over the last year or so. Um, she's a great artist. And in fact, uh, her art starts very, very young, as you can see from the images. These are some of the photos that, that, that Kelly uh, shared. Um, and um, it, goes, it goes through 20, 30 years of uh, uh, sort of skill and, and, and practice and work and so on. Uh, until one day, she, she heard this about this thing called Leon, uh, Leon 5e, of course. Uh, and then she found out that a, a chunk, a big chunk of her images up to that point from her online gallery had been crawled and scraped and, and fed into the model. So much that, in fact, you can now go and basically feed in this prompt, something like in the style of Kelly McKernan, 
you know, you can read the rest of the prompt. And it produces all these images, right? One of which is the real one, and you can probably tell which is which, but it, the, the replicates are, or the facsimiles are, are very, very close, okay? Um, lots more. You can actually produce this, obviously, quite quickly, and you can produce lots and lots of versions of this, um, all using, basically, Kelly, uh, Kelly's name as a prompt. So in fact, this has now become a cottage industry. Uh, I do not recommend going to Civit AI because it is honestly kind of gross. Um, there's lots of uh, not safe for work content, um, but extremely sort of biased towards one gender, uh, but we can all guess. Um, and then, you know, what you see here are basically perfect examples of what is now a, a sort of burgeoning marketplace for how to encapsulate your favorite artist as a model uh, and to replace them wholesale, right? So why pay for any sort of art when you can basically download something, uh, which is effectively a LoRa, which is a very lightweight version of Stable Diffusion that you can then slap onto Stable Diffusion and then generate your own version of whatever it is that you like uh, using Sam Yang, using any of these particular art styles. And you can see if you look closely, for example, uh, many of these models, and this is out of date, by the way, this is I think probably a month ago that I took the screenshot, um, and basically, we're talking about, um, oh, sorry, I actually got the screenshot from Sean, but I think that was roughly about a month ago. And we're talking about downloads of upwards of 20K for some of these models, right? Um, and more than that, uh, some of these folks who are generating the lores are actually asking for money to fund their further efforts. It's, it's kind of like a meta, uh, a meta commission, right? Like, don't, don't commission the real artist, commission the guy who's going to uh, take the artist's work and, and, and make a facsimile. So obviously, uh, you know, this has been going on for probably more than a year, a little bit more than a year. Um, and you can imagine sort of the, the, the personal impact on, on artists wholesale. And, and we're talking not about, obviously, a small group of artists. We're talking about artists across the globe, uh, every continent, lots of different countries. Um, yeah, so, so artists, particularly independent artists, have now have this choice of, do I post things online? and know that in all likelihood, it will only be a matter of time if I am reasonably successful, uh, that I will be incorporated into a LoRa or a model. Or do I just stay offline, protect myself, but basically re you know, cut off my own income because that's how uh, independent artists uh, gain uh, income is through commissions. So lots of secondary effects. Obviously, the mental, mental anguish on a lot of artists is severe, um, but even more so, uh, many are quitting, uh, of course, um, uh, downstream, if you will, uh, many of the aspiring artists who are younger, who are in art colleges, and I've talked to a bunch of art co colleges and, and faculty and so on, uh, their classes are all shrinking. Um, students are dropping out at an incredible rate because why would you stay when you see your role, role models and mentors who've, who are you know, 20, 30 years ahead of you in the industry basically get sucked in overnight uh, and become a model? Uh, so there is a lot of this that you can actually find on Twitter and on uh, different pages, uh, different social media platforms and whatnot. You can see how a lot of these uh, sort of technologies are impacting the industry uh, in very real terms. And the darkest corners, of course, you will find things like self-harm because uh, in cultures like Japan where, uh, you know, speaking up against the norm or against the sort of publicly declared direction of the culture is very much frowned upon, uh, it is much more challenging. And a lot of artists in Japan are in a much tougher spot. All right, so this is the darker version of what's been happening uh, for some time. And I would say the worst of this probably was, gosh, uh, this spring, probably. Um, and so what can we do about that? So the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about a few things that try to push back against uh, misuses of generative AI. And obviously, AI wasn't designed to do these things, but obviously, there's always harms that, that come with it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Glaze, which is something that uh, we've been building uh, or we built a while ago. I think uh, we submitted the paper in February. Uh, I'll show a brief timeline, but um, it's been out for a while, for quite a few months. And at the very end, I'll, I'll mention something called Nightshade, which just came out, I, well, came out, came out, quote unquote. Um, uh, we sort of, uh, uh, I guess the news about it came out uh, this particular week. Um, the paper was just finished last week. 
All right, so very quickly, uh, let's see, how am I doing on time? Uh, 15 minutes? Okay, so um, very quickly, I want to talk about sort of what preceded this and how we got here. Um, in about 2020, uh, we were starting to look at sort of the potential downsides and harms of generative AI. Uh, sorry, not even generative AI, just in general deep learning. And that's when, about that time, when the news about clearview.ai came out. And this was, I don't know if how many people remember, but this was the model that, uh, sorry, the company that scraped billions of images from online social media and everywhere else so that they could build uh, facial recognition models about for about 300 million people globally, I think. That's a rough number I remember. Um, and they're still doing this. And of course, the numbers are, are significantly higher than that now. Um, and one of the things that we built in 2020 was this tool called Fox, which basically, uh, at a very high level, um, is basically a, um, a, a image altering sort of filter, if you will, um, that perturbs the feature space position of a particular image or a particular selfie, let's say, so that you, it shifts the facial recognition position of that image into a much different position inside the feature space. Okay, for a given facial recognition feature track. Okay, so that uh, that piece of tool got a bit of press, and and we set up a user uh, mailing list, which is sort of the interesting part. Um, but you know, very quickly, this is what it does. It basically minimizes L two distance between where you are currently in the feature space versus someone who is very quite different in the feature space. Think about me and let's say Denzel Washington or someone like that. And then you try to basically minimize, shrink that distance between me, my real face, and the target in the feature distance, while uh, maintaining some uh, or perturbation budget in the uh, visible space. Okay, and the visible space here is, you know, I believe at the time we used DSSIM as a uh, similarity metric for visibility for human visibility, but you can also use, you know, uh, Infinity and so on. Uh, but the idea is then. Uh, you would have an image that, you know, visually to, to the human eye does not look very different, um, or there are small pixel level changes, but in the feature space to the facial recognition model or the training for the facial recognition model, you would be looking at feature set that was completely uh, quite different, right? And so if all my images or most of my images were shifted this way, then someone who actually does take a real image of me, a photo of me that, you know, Trader Joe's or something, sends it to the company, gets fed into that model, they would actually, that position in the feature space would probably be reasonably empty, at least not with my name around it. And I would, you know, the facial recognition model would return some sort of error with some sort of nearest neighbor, or some other identity nearby. So this is the idea for Fox. But what was interesting was that we, we set up this user list and there was a, a, a fair number of people on it. And then last summer, we, we actually got this, uh, uh, we got this interesting email um, and, and we still have it. And it's from this artist in, in the Netherlands, uh, Kim Van Doon. And, and Kim wrote, and she said, you know, with the rise of AI learning on images, I wonder if, if Fox can be used on paintings and illustration to warp the images and render them less useful for learning algorithms. And this was a really interesting question, but we had no idea at the time what was going on in generative AI. And so for us, this question made absolutely no sense. Um, and, and I remember, uh, being confused about what this email actually meant. Uh, I mean, why do you need to protect art? Uh, and we wrote back this co rather confused reply, basically saying, you know, I'm sorry, Kim, this is only for facial recognition. We don't know how to apply this for, for art, but, you know, thanks for reaching out. Kind of a useless reply. Um, and then a few months later, I think, uh, what, four months later, when in October, all the news hit about Dolly 2 and, and Stable Diffusion and Midjourney, and then I remember one day we're in the lab and 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 Sean uh, literally walked over to me and and he's like Ben is this like what they were talking about that 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 email from that artist and and we we're like oh okay maybe that's it so so we decided to go back to Kim and and ask what was going on and well this happened which is we got an invite to this uh, online town hall of artists uh, in November. And so I, I, remember, I remember jumping on that call, expecting, not knowing what it, whatever to expect, because uh, we were utterly confused about what, what was going on. And you get on, and, and it's some, there are some really big names. You know, this is a screenshot from the, from the YouTube uh, channel that this is, this is posted on. 
Um, but there's some really big name artists here and some very successful people in the professional field, people who work for uh, major movie studios and whatnot. Um, and there was about 500, 600 of them. I forget the exact number. Um, and, and they were just talking about how their lives are, had just been upended in the last two, three months um, by generative AI. And of course, uh, we had known relatively little about generative AI, and, and this was a complete sort of a, a, a shock to us. Um, but right after this call, I remember us thinking, okay, you know, we should do something about this. I think there is a technological solution uh, to doing something about this. So actually what happened then was over the next couple of months, uh, December and January, we reached out first to, to Carla, Carla Ortiz, um, and then uh, a, a couple other artists and basically enlisted their help on sort of connecting us to the artist community where we did a user study. Well, first we did a tool that we said, okay, I think we can do kind of what we did with Fox, this idea of feature perturbation in the feature space while maintaining visible uh, similarity to the original. And of course that's really challenging because in the art space, you would imagine artists, fine artists, creative artists, professional artists would care quite a bit about how much you can actually perturb their art uh, and, and and you know they can let you get away with that, um, but but perturbing that in the in the visible space with minimal pixel changes, while greatly disturbing and shifting the position in the feature space, and we weren't quite sure that we could do this because obviously diffusion models are quite a bit different from discriminative classifiers like DNNs, and also you know our style is this weird and fuzzy sort of feature space that we weren't quite sure held the same rules as something like uh, feature space for a facial recognition feature track. Okay, so, so we did this, we, we tried this, and we built this initial prototype and we did a massive user study of about 1150 something uh, professional artists. Um, and there were so many that signed up because actually uh, this is obviously uh, close and dear to their hearts. So by February, we had a user study done, a paper that was submitted uh, and, and some press to go along with it, New York Times and other things. Uh, in a month after that, we sort of built the first version of Glaze um, what became uh, known as Glaze um, into a software release. And then by July, we had a million downloads. Uh, by August, we actually had the presentation at user security. Uh, there, was a, uh, there were some awards as well, uh, Internet Defense Prize and, uh, and a paper award. Um, but then we had already also released this web service because <laughs> it took us a while to realize that actually artists uh, don't have a lot of money. And the large majority of them certainly don't have GPUs at their disposal. Um, and most of them, many of them, I should say, don't even have desktop computers. Um, and if they do, they were woefully out of date. Um, and so uh, some of them could afford GPUs and actually ran Glaze as an app, uh, but many of them did not. And so we built a free uh, web service uh, sitting on our GPU servers that did the computation for them. All right, so, so what does Glaze actually do? Uh, very quickly, here's a picture of sort of, you know, that's Carla's art. Um, and, and what happens is unprotected, you can take that art and you can basically do, you know, do fine tuning. And, and whether it's with a LoRa or with traditional fine tuning or, or uh, uh, um, you know, something else, um, you can fine tune a existing trained model. Most likely it is some version of uh, stable diffusion because it's free and public and, and highly available. And then you, once fine-tuned, you can produce a model that basically, on invoking the right you know, prompt, uh, like the artist's name, you can produce artwork that looks extremely like the original. Uh, I don't know that they've tried like reproducing the originals, but you can get pretty darn close. And then, of course, now you have this tool. You can have you know, the, the artist's paint brushes, as it were, um, at your disposal, and you can draw whatever it is that you'd like to draw without their permission or authorization. So... With Glaze, what happens is the artist takes their original art, runs it through Glaze. It does some computation uh, on a GPU. You know, a reasonably modern GPU it will take somewhere between 30 seconds and a minute. Uh, if you run it on CPU, it can take 30 minutes to, to an hour on some of the more faster CPUs and, and multiple hours if you've got an outdated PC. Um, so yeah, GPU is a big win. But anyway, so you compute this computation. It changes some pixels. Um, and then basically, uh, you know, the result is something dramatically different in the feature space, such that if someone were to take that protected art, use it to train and fine tune a art model like Allura, um, you would produce something that looks dramatically different, right? And you can actually choose the art style to project. I'm giving an example here when you take Carla's art, 
and project it literally to the style of, of Van Gogh. Um, and as you can see, you actually get a lot of Van Gogh-ness um, when you try to generate art fine-tuned this way. Okay, And clearly, if we're able to do this, then this is what we would define success, right? Because someone did all this work to try to replicate Carla's artwork, artwork and they got Van Gogh instead. Presumably, that is not what they wanted. And uh, for that, for us, that's a success. Right. Again, the optimization function is actually quite straightforward. It's just minimizing uh, distance in the feature space for some version of distance feature space um, closer to the target style that you're trying to get to. Um, and then, of course, subject to some sort of uh, distance perturbation uh, upper bound that you're limiting yourself to so that the visibility of these artifacts is very much limited. Okay. So for this, we actually use LPIPS, uh, which is from that great other paper on the unreasonable, uh, I forget the rest of the title, but you know what I'm talking about, that actually builds a mini model to try to mimic the human sort of perceptual features uh, that are interpreted by, by humans. Okay, so uh, what else am I missing here? The only thing in here that's uh, slightly non-obvious is what the target is. Okay, so in fact, what we actually do is you take the original image and you run it through stable diffusion and you say, do a style transfer to target style X, okay? And that's how you actually minimize and make efficient the perturbation budget. Because what it does is if you don't, if you don't do that, if you just take a random image, let's say from the Van Gogh uh, archives or something like that, um, your perturbation budget is gonna be spent very, very quickly because much of it is gonna be transforming the compositional content from let's say uh, a, a young woman you know, with dark hair to an old man sitting in an armchair or something even more different. And so in order to minimize that perturbation usage and, and to really focus a perturbation budget on stylistic differences, you do a style transfer beforehand and then you use the output of that as your perturbation target. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. All right, so, so more samples, just to, cause this is a very visual talk. Um, you'll see uh, a, a few artists on the left side uh, with some of their original art. Um, I mean, Van Gogh and Monet in here um, as well. Uh, these uh, middle uh, columns, if you will, are, are the generated output from fine-tuned models on the original art pieces. Um, and then these are some of the art pieces that you would get from a, a synthetic model, fine-tuned model, after it's been trained on not the original art, but the glazed versions of the original art. Okay? So obviously, I'm skipping some detail here. There's obviously a perturbation budget and how much you tune that and how much you allow in terms of visible artifacts affects greatly how far you can push in the feature space. And that in turn affects how completely warped the output is of the fine tune model that, that you're trying to get the attacker, for example, to, to produce, right? And if you turn up the knob quite a bit, right? Um, there was another paper uh, from a system called Mist that looks very much like Glaze. Um, but what they do is they turn up the perturbation budget extremely high, like 5X of, 5x of our upper bound of what we consider uh, unreasonably high. Um, and when you turn it up that high, you actually get some protection against image to image transformations because there's now so much perturbation stored in every single image that even a single image in an image to image transformation uh, process has enough perturbations to distort the output. Um, but that is a really, really high amount of perturbation. So for most artists, they, it's just not something that they can tolerate. In fact, all the artists that we uh, have interacted with after Glaze was released and who used the Glaze app and WebGlaze and so on have always been pushing against the lower bound, if you will, of what is the minimum perturbation possible to get some minimum protection level. Uh, you know, that's, that's pretty reasonable when you think about it. Okay. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this process is what we learned in this whole uh, process, right? So the first question that really came up was, you know, uh, should we deploy something? And and this doesn't sound that difficult of a question. Turns out many people feel differently. Uh, so, uh, you know, for me, this was a no brainer because mostly because the harms were so real and severe and immediate. Like I was literally talking to people who were uh, severely depressed and, and had anxiety attacks because of what was going on. Uh, and so it really seemed like stakes were extremely high and you had to do something because there was something that we could do. Um, but there was a counter argument, 
And, and we heard this from a number of people in the security community who basically said, why? Why would you do this? Don't. Because if it's at all imperfect in any way, if it can be broken in months, in years, whatever, then this is for naught. And, and you're offering some false sense of security and, you know, can you do it right? Can it be future proof? Because really nothing is future proof, right? Give it 10, 20 years. I don't even know if uh, generative AI models will be around. Greg bets that they won't, um, you know, who knows? It's, 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 they will probably be in some other format, greatly different from they are now. So nothing is future proof. So it's a real question of, can we offer that type of guarantee? We can't. Um, but at least for us, it, the, the trade-off was worth it. So what we did was this weird combination. We did this, we did a free app, um, but it was offline. In other words, it didn't need the network because so many of the artist community were already paranoid about just what it meant to run more AI on their art, right? And, and, and because they've been sort of lied to and cheated to, uh, cheated by so many different AI companies already who basically said, oh, you know, it's okay, upload your art here, et cetera. Uh, art Station, DeviantArt, there's quite a number of them. And so we, we did this free offline app, but it was also closed source uh, for, for a number of reasons, right? So we had to be, walk this really fine line between sort of transparency and gaining trust from the artist, but being as transparent as we can, but not being fully transparent because there's a lot at stake. Okay, so what happened after that? Uh, a lot of good things. Uh, the the artist reaction globally was really insane. Uh, I think for a little while there, we got so many emails on a daily basis uh, that we just we literally couldn't answer them all. We would just glance quickly through them. Uh, globally speaking, um, there are a lot of artists that that now use Glaze on a regular basis. Um, there are still a number of art galleries online that still have signs that say closed, uh, while we glaze everything, uh, cause glazing for a lot of artists do take, does take a while. And if they have a big gallery, then it really does take weeks, uh, um, sometimes longer. Um, and more so than that, the, the artists have been extremely helpful in helping us develop glaze. So we actually, everything from the specific schematic of how the layout of the app should look like to the color scheme, to the logos, everything has been actually a um, uh, ton of input from, from artists. Um, they've actually, uh, some of them have even taken money out of their own pocket to run advertising campaigns for Glaze, uh, which is really quite uh, unexpected. All right, so let me talk about some of the other things. Um, so there are other interesting things like, uh, sorry, one thing here. Um, well, it's an adversarial tool, so you would expect that there would be attempts to bypass it. And, and sure enough, there were, even on the first day. Um, someone tried to, to do a reverse uh, prompt uh, generation attack, which was quite interesting at the time. Certainly, we didn't expect it. Um, and, and they were quite generous uh, in their response and said, yeah, okay, this looks like it definitely does the job and you know, great work, et cetera. But that was the output of that particular attack. Um, more interestingly, or I should say, uh, another attack that lasted much longer um, was what was known as basically the sort of the pixel smoother attack, if you will. Um, within, uh, I don't know, what was that? That within a week of us releasing the prototype, there were already posts on international forums talking about how basically, um, you know, uh, Glaze had been bypassed. And we're like, wow, that's really fast. Who did it? Um, and is this, uh, uh, <laughs> if, if you use ControlNet, you'll know who he is. Um, but he's a, a hacker who wrote uh, a, a GitHub post that famously proclaimed that he can sort of bypass Glaze in about 16 lines of code. Uh, and he wrote basically a pixel smoother. And he believed that by removing the artifacts that are a result of Glaze's uh, alterations, that that would remove the effect of Glaze on the image. Turns out it's not easy as that. Uh, and so he actually uh, added an update on his own GitHub page, I think a couple of weeks later. Yeah, a couple of weeks later, that basically says, hey, look, I guess it didn't work. We'll worry about this later. Um, and that's it. Okay. Um, and I, I do know that Glaze is constantly under attack. And right now, I think there are at least about three groups who are still uh, actively trying to bypass Glaze. Um, so we are constantly sort of uh, updating and, and sort of analyzing potential countermeasures um, on a daily basis, um, as, as much as we can, so that we can update 
uh, glaze and, and to make sure that it's uh, still robust against the, the latest attacks. Uh, one thing that I, I do want to also mention is that um, there's sort of a lot of interesting things that came out of this process, right? Other than just learning about how to deploy real software to real population of users and, and to do so at reasonably large scale. I think the latest numbers are somewhere around 1.3 or 1.4 million downloads. Um, but you know, in an adversarial form, this is quite interesting because I, I I've never deployed an adversarial tool at scale. Uh, I don't know that I I remember uh, a recent example of something like this. But it turns out that most of the attackers actually I should skip to the next slide. This will uh, so things that we learned that we never expected. Um, things like the fact that you know when we write security papers, uh, we always target the strongest possible attacker. We always think, you know, when the attackers come, they will come for your core algorithm because that's where that's where the 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 sort of the the the, the idea is. And they're gonna break your thing and and it's gonna be some you know genius hacker in the basement, you know, doing uh really smart math and those kind of things. Turns out that was wrong. Um, you know, at least for Glaze, uh, you know, most of the attackers had very little understanding of machine learning. Um, but they did use the tools a lot. Um, and, and they just hated the fact that there was anything standing in their way of generating machine learning and, and mid-journey images and whatnot and, and training on artists and so on. Okay, so, so it turns out that bad mouthing and misinformation campaigns were extremely popular and somewhat effective. Okay, so let me go back to this one slide here. Turns out that the biggest thing that stopped artists from using Glaze was actually not so much the complexity of Glaze or the GPU cost or the or the just the massive download size or or any of these other things. It was the fact that there was constant Twitter, Twitter threads about the fact that Glaze was broken by pixel cleaners like four or five months after the guy who wrote the pixel cleaner admitted that it didn't work. Um, but in, misinformation spreads on Twitter extremely well. Um, it turns out that later on, months later on down the road, um, it wasn't just the pixel cleaner and misinformation campaigns about that. It was the fact that someone cloned that GitHub repo and called it something else. And then that started a completely different misinformation campaign about that tool now breaking glaze. And of course, when you actually look, it was like, oh, well, this is cloned from that other tool, which already we knew about. The other thing that was completely new that I did not anticipate at all was the fact that um, some of these guys uh, who wanted to attack Glaze actually used antivirus programs uh, weaponized to attack Glaze. Um, and turns out, and, and I knew this, but I didn't expect it to be used this way, but VirusTotal um, has a thing where you can upload binaries and report them as Trojan horses or Trojan viruses, okay? And so enough of these guys got a coordinated effort together to take the Glaze binaries, including many of the feature factor core library files, and, and upload them to VirusTotal and to label them as, as a Trojan uh, virus. To the point where now Kaspersky and Windows Defender both think that Glaze is a Trojan. And this actually happens. So the most common, the, the most sort of you know random Twitter messages I get from artists is like, Oh my God, I just installed the app and it says it's a Trojan. What's going on? Have you guys been hacked? And I'm like, no, it's just this annoying thing that I can't get rid of because there's no recourse. None of these antivirus companies, despite the fact that they use crowdsource uh, virus signatures, have any way of uh, dispute. So you, if you get nailed this way, you're stuck because uh, there's nobody at VirusTotal or, or these uh, antivirus companies for you to reach out to. And that was kind of strange. What else? Um, finally, just a, a, another thing, you know, it turns out that cultural and language barriers have huge impact on security. Uh, and, and Glaze has been all around the world quite a bit. There, there's organizations in different countries of artists that use Glaze quite a bit and advocate for Glaze and all these things, um, except Japan. And Japan has this insular, sort of more insular culture and the language barrier is a real thing. And so for many of the artists uh, in Japan, they have trouble understanding you know, the documentation on Glaze. So they don't, they can't quite trust it. And, and that has really been, a, 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 I guess, a big reason why Glaze hasn't uh, taken hold so much in Japan. Uh, so a lot of the Japanese artists that we talk to are very frustrated because of this barrier problem. So uh, we're actually going to try to do something like that about that by, by translating uh, natively a version Glaze into Japanese. 
All right. So we've talked to lots of different groups, lots of different guilds, organizations, advocate groups, uh, uh, so on. Uh, we talked to advocates groups in the EU. The Ugar group has been exceptionally effective at pushing e regulations on regulating AI. We talked to a bunch of uh, different federal agencies and legislators uh, and at the state and national level. Okay. So that's all good. Um, I have maybe a couple minutes left. I want to quickly, I don't have much time at all. I'll, I'll mention Nightshade, which is sort of something that we started working on uh, basically, what, a few months ago, the minute we, we had Glaze out the door. And Nightshade is, well, it's a poison attack uh, in the wild. And so what does it do? Um, well, it's a poison attack. So, so traditionally in a poison attack, uh, the, the idea behind Nightshade is this. Uh, normally you think about a poison attack, a poison attack that corrupts training data and manipulates the uh, neural model into doing something unexpected, misclassifications, whatever. Um, typically speaking, you know, people expect something like 20% of a ratio between poison data and benign data in order for the poison attack to really be successful. Um, and so that's probably one of the reasons why I think most people don't really think about poisoning uh, diffusion models, because you think about the diffusion models training data set as something like a few hundred million, 600 million, maybe a billion or more. And you think 20% of that is, is a lot. Turns out that you don't have to attack the whole model, but you can actually target specific prompts. And when you look at individual prompts, like dragon or car or dog or something specific, then the amount of training data actually associated with that particular class or prompt is very small. And, and then the attacks become much more realistic. So here are some images. And, and this was Stable Diffusion's latest model, SDXL. And you can see that, you know, and, and by the way, this is the sort of the naive version of the attack, unoptimized, uh, just dirty poison, literally mislabeling, okay? But just showing that if you just do the absolute minimal thing, uh, 50 images of a uh, cat images labeled as dog and, and stable diffusion start to get really, really confused. And you know, you've got a dog with six legs or whatever that is. Um, by the time you get 300 poison images, um, you're now into fully uh, cat category. Okay, and there's much more details in, in the paper uh, that's now on, online, but this is the unoptimized version. It turns out you can do much better. You can do about 5X roughly better in potency. So that means one fifth the poison samples um, will get you something that is highly effective. By highly effective, we mean 80% uh, plus, 90% plus of people who look at the image say that this is a successful poison. Other things, again, uh, the, the optimization function is quite similar to some things that we've done before. But with this, we can actually make this a clean label attack, meaning that the benign image looks still the same. Um, it's just like Glaze, you're trying to minimize visible perturbations and artifacts. Um, so it still looks like a dog. It's just now it's going to teach the model to output a cat. Interesting concepts like the fact that it has this property we call bleed through, which means that when you target a particular prompt like dog and you transform it into a cat, turns out it affects nearby semantic related terms. So puppy, husky, wolf get sort of different levels of perturbations and, and transformations depending on, you know, for example, L2 distance from the original target. Uh, there are other fun things, like you can actually compose them, right? So you can actually change the artistic style and the compositional term that you're trying to, to depict with that style. And so, you know, uh, you want a dog in fantasy art and you get a cat in impressionism, uh, that kind of thing. And then finally, there's some interesting results, uh, details in the paper, but at some point, once you put enough stack, enough of the attacks together, the models have trouble uh, responding to many uh well, the most basic terms. Uh, then the model starts to potentially implode. All right, so I will stop there. Uh, maybe a minute or two for questions. Um, and uh, yeah, some pretty pictures. Um, this is really great work, thank you. Um, so. Is Glaze agnostic to the diffusion models, or it's not? Um, so, uh, so it's it's trained and and it operates mostly on stable diffusion because that's what's freely available and and you can use that as a feature tracker. Um, it does, based on tests that we've seen, transfer reasonably well. 
Um, but we don't have full access to some of the other proprietary models, including Imagine, Dali, and so on. So we we can't promise full on results for those. But on some of the models that we've been able to test transferability on, it's been reasonably strong. Um, there are changes across different architectures that will affect transferability, um, but there are ways to get around that. So yeah. Uh, but to be frank, most of the attacks that we're trying to actually mitigate and disrupt are done on stable distribution. Thank you. Really cool work. Um, I was wondering for for um, some of your methods, you need to pick the target classes. How do you choose those? And are some target classes more effective than others? Yes, that's a very good question. And yes, more some target classes are more effective than others. Uh, this seems non-intuitive, but we learned from the Fox days that where your projecting target is really does matter. There was a fiasco we had where we put mustaches on little babies because the target projection positions in the feature space were so extreme outliers. And we learned from that not to do that anymore. Um, so, so yeah, the, 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 there is a question of just sheer distance in the feature space between styles that you're trying to project to. You want to get as far as you can, reasonably speaking, because you're never going to actually fully shift there. You're only going to make it part way. So if the original distance is further away, even partial effect will get you something strong uh, in the output. Um, so yeah, so, so it does differ. Um, and it turns out certain styles are uniformly great as projection targets. Um, so we, we try to do a style specific uh, analysis, uh, depending on the artist's input, they give an image, we try to on the fly, if we don't have memory of what their style is, we'll do an on the fly analysis, find out what the ideal target is at that time, and then project it out like that. But yeah, there's a, there's a batch of like 60 styles or some number around there that we use as our uh, potential targets for projection. Greg? Yeah, uh, what happens if you train stable diffusion on glazed images? Training from scratch would it would it enable enable you to bypass then this protection? Um, no, because uh, glaze is a image specific perturbation, right? So the direction in the feature space, the magnitude, all those things are are pretty dynamic, uh, and there's a fair bit of randomness thrown in as well. Um, so it's not like a, a single deterministic algorithm that you can basically adversarially train on. Uh, there's too much randomness to 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 effectively be able to adversarially train. If I understand your question, uh, question. So um, most of the modern language encoders are universal, multilingual, essentially universally. Does it is are these methods stable if I replace dragon with the word for dragon in French or Arabic or Hebrew? Uh, that is a great question. I will try that. Uh, but my guess is that right now probably not because I I don't think the current models have sufficient language capability to understand that those terms reside in the same semantic space. What I do know is that when you take uh, things like, you know, a, a target puppy, and then you try to go for something like a dog, those are semantically close enough that, that there's automatic uh, sort of uh, belief through, as you will. Yeah. I had a question. If I saw voice artists and uh, things like music and other forms of art in different file formats, are those uh, possibly could use this tech technology, I guess? So the minute we released this news, uh, before we even released the Glaze app, and when the news came out in February, we got a ton of emails from people asking, can you do this for X, where X is everything from, you know, things you expect, like voice actors who want to protect their voice, to musicians, to writers. Uh, to dance choreographers who I had never expected to hear from. Um, but the answer is it really depends on the domain. And, and some domains, the answer is yes. Uh, voice, for example, is something that has been, you know, you guys have heard Drake, uh, Ariana Grande, all these sort of deep fake voices, if you will, synthesized voices, taking someone else's voice, singing their voice, et cetera. Um, there is an upcoming paper at CCS 2023, which is in, what, a few weeks, three weeks, um, where someone else, not us, uh, did a paper that basically addresses that. And they did something very similar technique-wise, intuition-wise, but in the voice domain, which is really challenging. And they actually tested against uh, Eleven Labs, which is probably the best and the most popular uh, voice mimicry uh, commercial product. Um, so yeah, so, so it can be done. Um, 
Oh, I have a question just regarding the artists since you have been talking to a lot of them. So um, I imagine that regarding visual artists, the ones that probably are the most affected are the ones who do digital art um, or illustration, kind of digital illustration. But I guess I would just imagine that people that do paintings are more like physical. They actually will benefit from AI in the sense that the prices of actual physical painting will go up since, you know, people can just like generate things uh, by themselves. You know, that drives for, because it's a scarcity, right? That, that drives prices up. So am I missing something? Or have you also heard of maybe artists that do more like paintings also like being, having some concern about this? I mean, I wonder. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's a very interesting question. I would say in the long term, perhaps that that effect will will take place, not in the short term. In the short term, you have to your assumption, sort of your model, uh, has an implicit assumption that there's perfect information, that everyone knows what art is available, and the market is is fully sort of uh, transparent. In reality, there's nothing of the sort. Um, all these artists are struggling for commissions in their own way, in their own social networks, in their own followings on social media. And most of them, what they see is they're directly impacted by the fact that many uh, people who are potentially going to commission them now see similar art elsewhere, or they can just think, oh, I can just generate this uh, for free. Um, and what's actually happening is things like book publishers and um, yeah, book publishers is actually a really big one where they are literally, and magazine publishers are now, instead of going to real artists for images, they're just generating uh, mid-journey. And so when that happens, the immediate response is that income drops to zero. And holy cow, I could tell you, I, I can't even name, I can't even count the number of artists who I've talked to who are literally struggling to pay rent. Uh, and this is something that none of them have seen before. And it's not something that's like a one-off. It's persistent for the last four or five months, for some of them even longer than that. Uh, and it's just like the well going dry. And some of it is due to the strike uh, and, and the impact on studios and not doing movies and whatnot. But it's a lot more than that and it goes a lot broader than that. So 